for uh, Simon Torrance, which is a senior advisor, business model transformation uh, at Rainmaking, who's also a book author about the book Fight Back, right? How organization can fight back for other companies who are coming to take their market shares. And he made a great article recently about uh, open, open uh, embedded finance, and he will tell us a little bit more about it. And as keynote to Mark Boyd, the famous API analyst and writer and founder of Platformable, who just released this, uh, uh, let's say, state of banking APIs uh, quarter, quarterly um, uh, for 2020. And he will they will tell us a little bit more about this. So I will uh, ask Simon Torrance to, uh, to be on stage. Right, Simon, are you here? Yes, I am. Yeah, perfect. So I'll ask you to share your screen. Great. Just to say, we're really glad to have you. The stage is yours. Uh, yeah, uh, enjoy your time at API Days and meeting our API Days community. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Mehdi. Um, I'm going to talk about embedded finance as the next wave of innovation and value. And I'll define what it means. I'll show some examples and benefits of it, uh, how it's being enabled by different players, and then what are the strategic imperatives for all kinds of organizations, whether you're a bank, an insurance company, another type of corporate startup investor or tech company. So why is it exciting? What is the market opportunity? Well, if you look at the current trends in payments and the distribution of payments, you're starting to see that embedded payments, payments embedded in other people's uh, products and services, is growing dramatically as a proportion of payment distribution. And if you just take the trends in the US, for example, extrapolate them to Europe and Asia, you get a very interesting market opportunity. On the right hand side, if you add payments with then lending and insurance and other types of financial services, the opportunity is somewhere in the region of $7.3 trillion for those who enable embedded finance. And what that means, that's market value. That's the value of companies that is that are enabling embedded finance. And the, my prediction is around 2030, we'll get to this level. Now with COVID, it might be delayed a bit, but it's still a very large figure. And just to put it into context, if this does happen in the way I've described and we'll talk about at this event, that would mean we're creating new businesses or new divisions of businesses, which are potentially bigger than the top 30 global software companies today and double the size of the top 30 global financial institutions today. So this is why it's a very exciting topic, particularly for VCs, for entrepreneurs, and why it should be a very exciting topic for banks and insurers and others. And essentially what's happening is that uh, financial technology has become very sophisticated now. And in a, new types of innovation are being built on top of it. And whereas the software companies grew powerful through leveraging the internet, cloud and mobile technology. And banks back in their time uh, grew strong through leveraging licenses and deposits. Now we're seeing a whole new industry growing up, exploiting the latest in financial technology. So I'm gonna try and break it down, show you some examples and describe what's, uh, what's driving this forward and what, what things companies need to do. Um, but the key question, I'd like you to think about um, during this presentation and the rest of the event is this, where to play and how to win. Those are the two key strategic questions for any organization. So a bit of introduction to me. I'm a senior advisor to uh, leadership teams and boards on the topic of breakthrough innovation, platform and ecosystem strategy, and venture building, creating joint ventures with corporates to uh, take advantage of new opportunities like embedded finance. I work with the World Economic Forum on some of their programs related to these topics. And through Rainmaking, uh, I, I, I work with the Startup Bootcamp. And many of you may know Startup Bootcamp. It's, I think it's the second biggest 
investor by volume in the world in, in fintech. And so through that enormous ecosystem, it gives us insights into what's happening and what might be coming through into the future. So let's start with a definition of what embedded finance is. And here's one I'm going to share with you and suggest, but maybe we can refine it together over the course of the next few months. But this is how I currently see it. It's about abstracting financial services functionality into technology to enable any product or service provider or indeed developer to seamlessly integrate innovative financial services into their customer propositions and experiences. And it can be a, a visible complementary add-on like Yes, the analogy being a warranty or insurance that comes when you book a, a flight, or it can be an invisible native component, as you have when you get in an Uber taxi. You, the payments are sorted out in the background. It's part of Uber's service. And the, the benefits are that it helps other organizations, not just the financial services sector, other organizations across multiple sectors create better customer experiences. With new technology, it's very, very easy to integrate into any other person's uh, digital services. It leverages real-time data, and it creates lots of new revenue streams. And you can see on the right there some examples that are well-known in terms of Starbucks with its 5 million uh, customers having cash accounts through its digital wallet, Shopify making half its revenues from payments and increasingly lending now to its, its members. Insurance tied up with um, fitness trackers and health monitors. And then the real innovation or the, the real incredible innovation at the moment is coming from China. And as you know, WeChat has multiple financial services embedded in its uh, service. And Yua Bao, uh, which is a money market fund uh, for investments embedded in Alibaba's ecosystem. So these are well-known examples, um, but the application of embedded finance um, it doesn't stop at in these in these areas. It, it can be applied to healthcare, agriculture, nearly any type of sector. And here's one I found recently, which I thought um, I guess demonstrates the, the the part of the full potential of embedding finance and in, and creating something that is good for the world. And this is an example from sub-Saharan Africa, whereby in that part of the world, many people just don't have electricity. They spend a lot of money on kerosene to light their lamps and power uh, their housing. And we in, in London, we, we don't we don't have that problem. We, electricity is just in the background. It's embedded in our lives, if you like. Um, but one company thought, well, given the uh, given the, the the amount of sun there, why could we not make solar power available to people who are off the grid? But the problem is solar power equipment is very expensive. Turns out, though, that the cost of the people are paying for kerosene to light their lamps is, is not much different than the cost of a solar system amortized over time. So what Zola, this company, did is they said, let's embed credit and payments into the product to allow people to access solar energy, um, but pay for it over time and pay for it over the mobile phone, thus bringing uh, affordable energy to people who are off the grid. And now in, uh, in, th in this part of the world where they operate, there are 420 million more people who now have affordable solar energy than they did 10 years ago. So there is a real social uh, dimension to embedded finance beyond new ways to make money. Now, there are very tangible commercial benefits for merchants, and that's why you're seeing those trend figures that I showed you earlier on. And I'll share with you three examples. There are many more, but from different types of businesses. On the left here, we have a, a SaaS business called Toast, and it provides um, uh, software to the restaurant industry. Now, it has a, it has a very interesting vertical software uh, business growing very well. But what it realized is if it could also offer payment capability to its customers, it would increase its total addressable market by over three times 
its normal SaaS business and potentially increase the average revenue per user by that margin as well. So rather than stopping at just selling the operational management uh, SaaS service, Toast says, why don't we also offer the ability for, pay for restaurants to take payments enabled by, um, by service providers that help us do that, and we can increase our revenue by a significant amount. That's why there's demand for embedded payment capability. If you then look at online retail and take the example of bicycle retailing, in this case, this is an e-bike, um, it's an expensive item, but online retail has very, very slim margins, particularly for products like this. And it turns out that working with a company, an insurance as a service company that enables uh, this organization to embed insurance at the point of purchase, the bike retailer can increase its net profits by 50% because the margin on selling insurance is extremely high. It's very valuable to the customer. And it nowadays with modern technology, it costs, it takes virtually no time to embed this capability into their service. And then the final example here, this is a advanced speaker, costs about $200. And on their website, maybe just you can just see um, in the small writing on the right there, they've embedded not only the ability to buy now, pay later through a series of um, installment loans, but also in the same place, insurance. So in the same point of sale for this company, they're offering loans, interest-free loans, plus insurance. And what they're finding, and other companies that are doing this, are finding that it increases the order value by a significant amount here, and it also increases conversion. When people are looking at buying this product, um, the, the fact that they can pay for it in a way that's convenient for them and also have peace of mind through extended warranties and insurance increases their chances or their likeliness to pay. So there are significant tangible commercial benefits for merchants. And we've barely scratched the surface. You know very well, as, uh, as well as I do, about um, the, ability, the opportunities in mobility and all kinds of other industries. So why is this, um, why is embedded, insure, uh, embedded finance growing so fast and projected to continue to do so? Well, COVID, in fact, provides very strong tailwinds for this along with accelerating technology and indeed capital, abundant capital looking for new sources of investment. And today, sadly with COVID, we, we are under increased pressure as individuals, as small businesses, as large businesses. And the financial services industry has not been very responsive to our needs. If you're poor, the cost of getting a loan is significantly higher uh, than if you are well off. Um, the ability to get insurance that matches your needs is often very difficult and cumbersome. So the ability to match financial services, which is the exchange of value and the mitigation of risk with the needs that you have in a way that's much more seamless and attractive is, very, is, is increasingly important. And accelerating digitization, as you probably know, is also changing the nature of industry itself. It's blurring the boundaries between, between different sectors and creating new digital ecosystems um, that require finance and insurance and other services in very new ways. And in fact, dominating this trend is the movement towards platform-based business models. And I'm going to describe how this work, what, what platform-based business models mean and how it applies to different businesses later in this talk. Um, but I wanted to say that I wanted to share with you some analysis here um, showing the, the comparison of companies that operate platform business models with those, which is the majority today, of companies that operate traditional business models, manufacturing or even financial services. Uh, and you can see the comparison at the top. Those businesses are thriving even in the COVID environment because things are moving to digital so fast. And many people say that we're getting more change in the last six months than we've had in the last six years. Those who are winning 
are those that have and are deploying the most powerful digital business models. And the most powerful digi digital business models are platforms. We'll come back and talk about that shortly. So digitization is shaking things up, and it's certainly shaking up the world of financial services. The old world used to look a bit like this. It, it was quite simple. Um, now, what's happening through digitization is we're starting to see the fragmentation or the modularization of industry stacks. And you can see I've just picked out banking and insurance here as two examples here. And it means that these different elements that in the past were all provided by one type of company, a bank or an insurance company, are now being able to be offered by other digital companies. And we're going to hear at this conference from many, many of these players. And uh, you, you can see on this diagram, there's a real battleground emerging uh, within the banking and the insurance stack in particular, and increasingly in the lending and other stacks where companies are, are, being, are able to provide these capabilities as a digital service to other companies, not just financial services, startups, but also increasingly non-financial services companies. And of course, we know about all the wonderful uh, consumer apps uh, in, in banking and ins in insurance, and we're starting to see more and more investment in let's call it capability as a service, financial infrastructure. And what does this mean for the incumbents? Well, there is, an there is a danger that they get pushed back to the least profitable part of the industry, um, the balance sheet and the license. And so there is this tussle uh, between um, uh, very sophisticated digital startups supported by venture capital and the incumbents about who's going to, where are they going to play along uh, this new, new new stack. And we're also starting to see, of course, the blurring, as we said, of industry sectors within new ecosystems and customers maybe going to non-financial services companies to access their financial services needs. And we're starting to see products, physical products that are connected to the internet, makes it easy to create a software layer on top um, and provide uh, services through apps connected to them the emergence of digital wallets, and an explosion of new sources of data from sensors and other connected devices, and the emergence of a new type of customer, the developer. And this is probably the biggest or one of the biggest um, uh, topics that we need to discuss today. How do we support the developer in stimulating new innovation? And speaking to the industry and looking ahead, talking to some of the people working right at the cutting edge of this space at the moment, I'm starting to see the emergence of cross-sector developer platforms. So not just for banking or payments or cards or, or, or data or um, customer account data, but across all types of financial services and new um, developer platforms and marketplaces starting to emerge. And indeed, we, of course, need to keep in mind the emergence of digital assets and blockchain. So we're entering a, a different type of, um, of, of environment, which opens up lots of opportunities and then creates the, the ability to support the new, um, new markets like embedded finance. And the battlegrounds are starting to hot up as different players consider their positions in this new evolving space. Now, digitization is also increasing the decline of old business models. And this is some analysis from McKinsey showing the economic profit of different sectors. Economic profit is the profit after cost of capital. It's the measure that is not shown in investor uh, presentations because it's really a pure measure of profit after the resources you use up to create your services. And you can see here that the financial service industry with the old business model that has been operating for you know, centuries in many cases is, was not highly profitable before COVID in the period 2015 to 18, but it's due to get worse as digitization intensifies. So there's a real pressure on the incumbent industry to reinvent itself and that will, that will stimulate or should stimulate more innovation in the market for the benefit of customers and society. 
Now, I talked about platform business models and embedded finance is an example of a platform business model, but we're starting to see the dominance of platform business models in financial services as well. We know already that the top, I think seven of the top um, most valuable companies in the world across all sectors are platform businesses. But now we see the big shift in financial services over the last 10 years. And Visa, Mastercard, PayPal, Ping An are all platform businesses at heart. Some of the others you can see here are trying to move in this direction, but slowly. And waiting in the wings, we have other digital platform business models, uh, businesses, which will soon supplant some of the older players. So let's try and understand what a platform business model is, because many people talk about platforms and they, we talk about technology, but there's actually an economic model which is really important to, to appreciate. And a platform business essentially connects people who've got something with people who want something. Let's just call them producers and consumers. Consumers can be customers, they can be machines, they can be organizations. And producers can be anything. It could be could be financial products, it could be content, it could be physical products, data, apps, money, ideas even. Platform businesses are successful because they connect these parties together without necessarily, without necessarily having to own the products being connected. Now, what it means for most for traditional companies is they have some of their own products, they find complementary services that'll be valuable to their customers, and they engage developers to create, to innovate for them, just like Apple does. Apple provides, makes its core business is making phones, but it co-ops, it leverages an army of third parties to create incredible apps that add value to their customers and make their core product of phones very attractive. And as many of you will know, the economic uh, power of this model is called network effects, where the platform becomes more valuable the more people who use it. Now, there are key requirements to create a platform that is successful. You need very easy to integrate plug and play infrastructure, very easy for producers to plug in, very easy for consumers to access. Uh, you need to create workflow tools as well to make the interactions and transactions as effective as possible. And essentially, you're, you're leveraging data, you're, you're, you're mining and collecting data so you can optimize connecting the producers and consumers together. And you create rules uh, under which this activity can happen, the governance models. And for any business, whether you're a startup, a financial service um, incumbent, or you're a retailer, or any business from any sector, you can play different roles in this very powerful business model. You can create your own platform businesses and be a um, uh, right at the center here. That's one very legitimate role. We'll talk about in a second how companies have done that. And as we've seen, those that do it and can manage to do it become incredibly powerful. But equally, you can be a consumer of platform businesses. You can use platforms to access products and services and human resources increasingly and data that are too difficult to do within your own organization. You can be a producer. You can create products and sell them through platform businesses as well or make data available. Or indeed, you can create workflow tools that enable platform businesses to be successful. And one of the areas for embedded finance is that last point. It's about embedding financial services capabilities into these very powerful platforms, which around themselves create ecosystems of many, many different players, producers and consumers. That's one of the biggest market opportunities uh, for embedded finance, where people are looking to create specific workflow tools to enable platforms and the ecosystems around them to flourish. So uh, in, in some of the work I do with the World Economic Forum, um, it's about trying to make simple and clarify how new types of platform business models um, work and how they can be incorporated and adopted by traditional businesses. And so I'm going to share with you some work I've been doing recently with the World Economic Forum, which will be published soon, um, to, that tries to clarify the five main uh, platform business model archetypes to show that there are, there are differences between them, but all of them are relevant uh, to any company, at least to understand so they know how to play with them, or indeed they may want to create businesses or en enhance their business 
with some of these principles. But the very basic level, and this is where most companies spend most of their time, it's about digitizing their existing businesses. And that can mean for banks and insurance companies, um, automating their processes, becoming much leaner, reducing costs, and making it much easier for their customers to access their products and maybe provide some complementary products and services uh, to those customers. But the real, the real um, powerful platform business models, we can characterize like this. There are four main types, and there are shades of gray between them. They overlap, but I'll just quickly share them with you. And I've put a few examples from the, the finance uh, world here, and there are many, many more that you'll know very well. But the, the, the starting point is often new digital solutions that solve a problem really well. Uh, typically, they are programmable. They can expand into into broader marketplaces or ecosystems, um, but they address problems and unmet needs, and they can scale very fast. And you can you know the main fintech companies, increasingly banks are investing heavily here as well. Now, developer platforms are those that new types of infrastructure that connect the capabilities of financial services and allow developers to embed them in other people's uh, products and services. That's where I would put embedded finance. But indeed, there are other types of platform businesses like online marketplaces, which don't own any of the assets, just connect people together at scale. And there are some examples there. Now, ultimately, ultimately, the most powerful business model of businesses in the world create or ecosystems around themselves. And I shared some examples uh, with you earlier on. And uh, we're starting to see not just the Chinese innovators like Ping An, who, as you may know, have created um, platforms that are nothing to do with financial services, to do with buying and selling houses, to, in terms of telemedicine, in terms of um, automotive. And they have created these new platforms to be, to be part of people's everyday lives. And then they have embedded their financial services into those new ecosystems and created a very powerful business on the back of that. And indeed, some more traditional businesses like Tinkoff Bank from Russia has done the same. And, and Spare Bank in Russia is another good example. So we're starting to see traditional companies looking at how successful the digital companies from China and Silicon Valley are and looking at how they can um, adopt or adapt their approaches to their situations. So just finally, I'm going to finish with what I think is the, the most important point about what to do about this. Um, and I do a lot of work, particularly with incumbent businesses, but the principles apply to startups as well. Um, trying to create new types of business models within your core business almost never works because the, the business has been set up for a certain type of business model a certain type of operating model, the metric, the skills, the culture, um, the hierarchies are all about delivering the core business model. And if you try and bring a digital business model, a platform business model, and operate it from within the core, it almost always fails. And so my advice to companies is we need to create a separate space for the new business models like embedded finance to be successful where we can fast track the future that space needs the same if you like prestige within the organization and critically it needs a, a new governance model to make sure that it can access the assets and capabilities of the core business and secondly that it's adding value back to the core business it's not creating business which is not relevant to the core. And if you can get these things right, if you can get this governance and structure right, so you can scale up new ventures, that you can also apply new approaches to collaboration with innovators and indeed create entirely new external ventures to fast track activity in more uh, challenging business models, then you, have an, uh, then you have the opportunity to change the fundamental Fundamentals of your um, of your business model and be successful. And on the left hand side, APIs is just the, the mandatory um, uh, table stakes that every company needs to undertake. And the questions we need to ask fundamentally about embedded finance are where to play and how to win. Fundamentally, of course, we're all about solving problems for customers, and that should be always our starting point. 
So I hope that has been interesting and useful. And I thank you very much for your attention. And I very much look forward to discussing it with you over the next few minutes. Thanks. Hello, Simon. Thank you very much for uh, the, the, the presentation. Uh, so yeah, a lot of things, a lot of things actually appear uh, from uh, uh, from the discussion. The the the, the first question is uh, I would uh, I would say because tomorrow we have a one of the first keynote uh, who is a uh, uh, Nigel from Rails Bank, and the, he, his talk title is revitalizing the core, right? And at the end on your last slide, actually, you show that yeah, there are two big arrows, right? So today, how a company should think about what they should embed from others to revitalize their core, right? Because maybe the, what they're, you know, this banking as a service platform or finance as a service are actually doing better things that they, that they do more agile and faster. But also they need also to think how they could embed into others, you know? So this is really like supply chain, right? Uh, who are my suppliers? Who are in my uh, distribution channels? But how to rethink it in terms of, let's say banking and, and you know, financial services accessible by APIs. Yeah, well, I suspect that Nigel is talking about there's two markets there. There's the non-financial service market and the financial service. So in terms of, if you like, revitalizing the core of a retailer, for example, that would be or maybe an insurance company that only sells life insurance. I think what he's talking about there is embedding other capabilities to make your core proposition more valuable. So like, you know, the bike retailer adds insurance to make that total proposition more attractive. It's a better customer experience. Now, for the banking companies, I mean, Nigel's a bit of a competitor. Rails Bank is a competitor to them. It's, it's taking out uh, some of their capabilities and that they used to sell in very clunky ways. You know, uh, you, you, can, you can buy insurance when you buy a, a flight today or you can buy payment services. But up until now, it's been very sl costly, slow, complicated. Um, but with this modularization uh, of the of the stack, uh, as Rails Bank is doing, it's taking out a capability and making it available to other people so they can create more exciting propositions. So for the banks and incumbent financial institutions, revitalizing their core means at one level, they need dramatic uh, automation and cost reduction just to stay in the game. That's just to stay in the game. They also need to make their interfaces with their customers much more attractive. So they need to, they're competing with fintech apps to do that in terms of creating better experiences. But all of that is just the existing business model. It's just propping up the existing business model. And as you saw from my chart, the prognosis is that the economic profits are gonna get squeezed even more. So for financial service institutions, the incumbents, they critically need to fast track the future. And that's where they need to create their new business models, digital business models. And they need to do that in a separate space than within the core. They need to, to allow new ventures to be created in new ways, partnering with entrepreneurs, just like Ping An did in China, that, that revitalized their business and created this their spurt to growth. But critically, as I said at the end, they need to connect these things together. And the moment I'm seeing too much of this activity trying to be done in the in the core of the of the bank or the insurer, and not enough uh, allocation of capital and resources to a separate space where they can really fast track it. At the moment, it's been a bit of innovation theatre over here. Now we need to get serious. Yeah, thank you. Just to say for all attendees, you can ask question question in the in the chat of the stage, and and I will be glad to uh, to relate this question to to Simon. So Simon, in in the API space, like we used to say that in twenty in two thousands, to be digital, you needed to have a uh, you needed to have a website, right? At least a website strategy or web strategy. In two thousand ten, you need to be mobile, right? You needed to have a, a mobile strategy, mobile applications, right? To to uh, to be fully digital. But now in twenty twenty, you need to have APIs to be embedded in everybody else's website or in everybody else's mobile application where it makes sense. So now it's the let's say the horizontal colonization. We used to have vertical, uh, you know, colonization and channels. Now it's now it's to be horizontal everywhere. And so the question like, that I see uh, most of the time is like, how to manage the build versus buy? How you know how to manage this this tough decision? Uh, 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 because you know, like 
some people wants to colonize you, but you want to colonize the business of others, right? How do you see that happening? A build versus buy for who? From which perspective? For for let's say just imagine a, a bank a bank today, right? A, a bank or a financial institution, you know, who who needs to uh, embed things from others and try to be embedded into others. How they will need to manage the fact, maybe on a strategy side, what do they accept to embed from others, right? That may be uh, that may be threatening their ability to deliver it in the future. Yeah, well, it, it comes back to that last point I made about uh, where to play and how to win. Yep. So if you think about if you think about how those digital ecosystems that are emerging, I mentioned, you know, they're, they're, it's not we're not in vertical sectors. We, we're boundaries are blurring. And let's take the mobility sector as a combination of not just car manufacturers, but all kinds of transportation services. So the starting point is always to have a clear view about how those ecosystems are developing and what your role could be within them. And that's the thing that people don't spend a lot of time doing, looking at that, the future of not their business, but those emerging ecosystems. Because the customers within there are will be very different to the customers that you've had in the past. As I mentioned, developers are a key customer group now. And uh, you know, particularly banks are not the, the best at engaging with developers if you compare to Company, the digital companies that we're going to hear about at the at the conference, the the fintechs who are who are much stronger, obviously, uh, engaging with developers. So the starting point has to be a vision of those ecosystems, how they're going to change, what that means for financial services, and what role do we want to play there, understanding the competitive environment that 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 might occur in that new situation, and only then. Can you make the decision about what do we want to control ourselves? What do we want to outsource or buy in from others? And if, if you think about that stack, as I said, the danger is that the bank, you know, the traditional bank gets squeezed down the bottom. Now, we know that a lot of banks are, you know, Marcus from Goldman Sachs is, has created a new bank with a bank as a service proposition. Standard Chartered has created a bank as a service proposition. So has BBVA. So the banks are starting to to fight back in this in this space to enable embedded finance. Um, but they will have to, the, the danger is, I mean, you're seeing them creating separate uh, entities to manage that. So they've got different people, different metrics, et cetera, which makes a lot of sense. But they're gonna step, have to step that up quite considerably if they want to compete. There is a there is a, a quote that I like that you know we, we we are shifting from product versus product competition to platform versus platform competition to ecosystem versus ecosystem competition and actually your five models uh, actually uh, shows shows exactly that we have a comment in um, in uh, uh, we have a comment in the in, in the chat about like you say ecosystem orchestration but an ecosystem should be able to orchestrate itself. This is what ecosystems are about. So, what what's the business model actually? You you talk about into business uh, into ecosystem orchestration. Are you because you orchestrate it where it should not be orchestrated itself? You take you you get you are able to capture some value, or because or you take a cut of uh, the current uh, how it organizes itself. Uh, uh, yeah, how do you see that? Yeah, yeah. So it's a fair point. Um, at one level, ecosystem means it could can be a description for a new type of market, let's say, as I say. So blurring boundaries between different sectors creates a new market, which we can call an ecosystem. Now, within there, there are different players. There are players who provide products into that ecosystem, and there are those who orchestrate aspects of it. And the orchestrators are what I call the platform business models. So those are people like Amazon and Apple and all the others. You know, Visa is an ecosystem orchestrator through its platform as well. So people who create a platform, they are in a position to orchestrate some aspect of the broader ecosystem. It, doesn't, it won't be everything, but some aspect of it. And that platform business model is very powerful because you're not having to do everything yourself. You're not having to create all the products. You're connecting people together maybe with your own products, but complementary products and services as well. Um, and so and so that that's a very good type of business model to play. And as I said, there's lots of different options for people within that. you can you can be the orchestrator, you can be the 
you know, the, you can use those platforms, you can enable them, you can supply into them. And so that's what I was saying there. Now, you know, ecosystems are by nature fluid and, and so on. And so the task for a commercial organization is to work out how could we create some type of service that, that can add value to that ecosystem and creates value for ourselves. And then there is those four different types of platform businesses businesses within ecosystems that can be created. The reason I, I use ecosystem orchestration at the top right uh, is particularly because for financial institutions, creating platforms in spaces outside of financial services is what a lot of them are looking at. So Ping An, as I said, created a, you know, uh, a platform for buying and selling cars or telemedicine or uh, other spaces. And it did that to create a new channel for its financial services, created a huge new market of, of users who then could become financial services customers. So that's the principle there. Yeah, thank you. We have a question from Paul Rahan, who loves your example on Zola, Zola Solar Product with Embedded Finance. Uh, but he says, he asks, from your work with the World Economic Forum, what can service designers in major Western markets learn from, oh, sorry, uh, um, Yeah, he, uh, someone commented again in the break. So uh, what can service designers in, ma in major Western markets learn from platform business models in the developing economies in Africa and Asia? Well, I think it's probably the, the notion of what we call uh, Jugard innovation, which means frugal innovation. You know, they don't have many, you know, in poor places of the world, they don't have the assets that, that, that we have in, in Europe and they solve problems, you know, very, very quickly because those problems are very urgent. And you, I mean, that, that example is a good one because they use mobile payments as well as, you know, they, they found the solution, which was about embedding the loans with the solar panels. And they started by working out what's the problem for the customer? How can we solve that? Now, there's no way a bank would have done that. The bank says, I've got these products. You know, if you want it, come to me and uh, we'll see what we can do. So I think it's um, the learning is start with unmet needs and customer problems and work out how to solve them in as frugal way as possible. And unfortunately, you know, traditional, you know, fat Western organizations have a very sort of slow and lumbering approach to innovation, but we need to apply probably this Dugard innovation approach, frugal innovation. We know we, we a lot of your audience will know test and iterate is utterly critical. One question from Ravi Shukla. Uh, what would you like to see policymakers, regulators do to accelerate or support ecosystem orchestration in financial service, services? Oh, it's a great, it's a very good question. So PSD2 and open banking has, has really been a, a massive liberator of, of this, an enabler of embedded finance, forced on the industry, of course. Now, that whole notion of data portability uh, is something, in fact, that regulators are looking at at other sectors so how to regulate or to uh, the the big digital platforms like amazon and facebook and google and the notion that regulators are looking at uh, is is imposing if you like psd2 type regulation on those sectors so as an individual i can choose my my data to be made available to other people to innovate on my behalf so i think i think that notion of data portability um, is probably the a key one for regulators to push not only in financial services, which we've, we've started, but also other sectors to even things up. And that data is where we can create enormous new value for everybody. Yeah, questions are raining now. People understood they can ask questions, but we only have two minutes left. Uh, one question about uh, 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 privacy. Uh, privacy because now, you know, with hyper apps, like who embed everything, or happy platforms who have who have a lot of parts of our lives. Uh, you know, at some point, the more embedded everything are, the more people are make, are able to make sense of what's happening. And so it, it, we, we arrive to a point where we we, we reach the limit of, of privacy and, you know, with a credit score in some countries in the in the Eastern world. Uh, what What's your point on how how embedded we should be and where's the limit? Yeah, well, I think that it, it, it creates a demand for privacy as a service propositions. You know, so for the innovators on, who are listening in today, you know, that's a hot area. 
um, that is just becoming, I mean, there's been a lot of work in this area in terms of creating personal data stores over the last few years, but now it's reaching a tipping point uh, for the reasons you've mentioned. So I think what we're going to start to see is, is people providing privacy as a service applications to allow uh, us as individuals to decide how, by, how much we want to control uh, our data. And so we'll see a lot more sophistication in that space. Yeah, last really quick two questions. Uh, it seems that, uh, you know, the GAFAs are really uh, profitable, but it seems, to, as you show, that banks are not so profitable anymore, right? Uh, uh, so uh, there is a saying that say that GAFAs don't go directly into, uh, into the financial market because it doesn't, it's not uh, rewarding enough. <laughs> Do you agree with that? For, yeah, the, burden, you... for the burden yeah, it is. Not... Yeah, you don't want the balance sheet or the regulatory, um, you know, burdens. As, you, as you know, everything above there is great, is very profitable potentially, and that's where you get to the seven trillion dollar uh, mark because this is software embedded in other people's products to make those products and services much more attractive. But you don't want to go near the uh, the regulatory and the balance sheet uh, aspects of this, and that's the danger that the incumbents get stuck there unless they act. They've got to act fast now. Yeah. Sorry, we, we reached our, uh, the time for people asking questions. Maybe a really quick one. Uh, is there an example to expand on the cross-sector developer platforms you're talking about? Is there an example of such? Yeah. Can you state one? Yeah, yeah I just, just quickly say, if anybody's got questions, go to LinkedIn and connect with me. I'd be delighted to answer them there or on, at the event later. But um, we're starting to see that. And I, I, I'm speaking to quite a few of the startups in, in this space. And they've come from different positions, but they're starting to add on those extra capabilities that cut across financial services. So I think watch this space. Maybe next year at the, the, at the event, we can talk about that. But that, this is my prediction. That's going to be a really hot space over the next year. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you. I think, yeah, we already see some uh, some cheers and some congratulations for the talk about how brilliant it was. So thank you. And again, for people who have questions, you can connect with Simon directly on LinkedIn.